world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews and gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Jonathan. Good job today. Uh, just a couple of things that we have. Um, today is a day when you're able to fill out the form for elders and tell them how much you appreciate them. Actually, it's just a yes or no. So yes means you appreciate them. No, you means they're dead fish. Uh, <laughs> Those are the only two choices, so that's that's kind of it. Most of you received a uh, email with a link in it, and that's certainly the easiest way to do this. It takes you right to it, and it just gives you a way to click through, and uh, we're not asking for lots of comments. It's just a yes or no thing. It takes you five seconds, and uh, you, then you're done, and it's completely anonymous. No problem with that whatsoever. And so, if you got the link, that's great. Go ahead and use the link. It helps. It counts for us. It tabulates for us. Please don't fill out 20. Just one is all you need. Uh, and so, we are in the process of affirming all of the elders, not just the one that we have now, but all of the elders. If you don't mark anything on that form, it won't let you turn it in without marking something. We do have one here at the building. If you don't have a computer at home and you want to fill it out on a piece of paper, again, if you've already done it online, no need for that. But uh, just make sure you know that if you don't mark a yes, then you are marking a no, whether you check the box or not. So just wanted you to be aware of that and uh, appreciate our elders for all that they do and being able to lead this congregation. If you did not get an email with that form in it, there may be two reasons. Either we do not have your email, and so if you would please, you know, call us or send us your email, that will fix that. The second is, you're not a member. So, place membership it is the members we are asking to vote on leaders, or I think vote's a bad word, affirm on leaders. And so make sure you're part of the church here and that you have a place with us. And we want you to be here. It's very upsetting with some of the things going on, especially for Deborah and Andrea as they're taking Sherman off of life support this morning, and for Diamond as well, for her mom. Would you pray with me this morning, please? Our Father, we hear about a lot of sickness, and we hear about a lot of things that are going on. And it causes us to be very concerned for people, and we just pray that you would have compassion on those who are nearing the end, Father, and that you would be with those families. And, Father, as this is such a difficult time for us, we know that there's a better place with you. But we pray, Father, for your comfort on these families, and especially as they are facing some of these things right now. We pray, Father, you'll take away all of the diseases, and especially the ones that plague us so much right now. We appreciate being in your kingdom, and we appreciate Jesus being our king. And we turn and we look at him because he is most important. And it is through him that we pray. Amen. So as you look at the passage that was read to us this morning, Jesus here refers to a kingdom. Pilate is asking him if he's king of the Jews. And Jesus says, well, you say that I am. And he's like, well, I'm not trying to say that you are. He almost claims like he doesn't allow. He doesn't 
uh, fit. And so he's saying, I'm not a Jew. You're not my king. And uh, your own people delivered me to you. Why are you even here? What did you do? You must have done something. And uh, Jesus simply says, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight, but my kingdom is from another place. It's from a different world. And that's what we want to try and look at today. But Jesus does say, I came for this purpose. I was born as a king. I came for the purpose of being a king and for establishing a kingdom. It's just that my kingdom doesn't fit here, and so I'm no threat to you. He also claims he's a witness to the truth. And Pilate turns to him at that and says, truth what is truth? He also finds no guilt in Jesus. Maybe that's the truth. There's not any guilt to bind him. And so as Pilate is trying to figure out what to do with him and how to deal with those whole situation, he, he's facing a lot of people who are very angry, who are very upset, who are insisting, who are demanding. Isn't it those times when we find it most difficult to decide what truth really is? Truth is easy if everyone agrees. Truth, truth is much more difficult if everyone disagrees and that if there are a whole lot of different sides to it. And that seems to be where Pilate finds himself. Jesus is innocent. He knows Jesus is innocent. Well, is that the truth? If that's the truth, then why are people wanting to crucify him? I saw this. Truth is like the sun. You can shut it out for a time, but it ain't going away. And hopefully we know that. We recognize that. We realize the truth isn't going away. And in Pilate's world, I'm not sure there can be any truth. It's all distorted. Because you have the very people that Jesus is king for declaring that he is not their king and that they should crucify him. In fact, they brought him to be crucified and they want to release from prison a criminal. Okay, the world is just upside down and backwards, isn't it? You've got an innocent guy who's about to be put to death, and you've got a guilty guy who's now being let go, and so it's no wonder Pilate is confused. What is truth? How do I make sense out of the world that I'm in? You know, can there be any truth in this whole thing? Because it's most difficult to understand this. Truth is they're crucifying their own king. The truth is he's going to die on a cross. I mean, who needs that? Truth, is it found in the flogging, in the thorn of crowns? Is it found in the beating of an innocent man? Is that truth? Pilate just says, I don't find any guilt in him. But there's plenty of guilt in the crowd. A few things that Jesus said are important. I want to look back at one of these. It's, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Okay. Why? Well, because that's how kingdoms are made in this world. Because we need organization, we need power, we need territory, we need people, we need money. And all of those things are what goes into making up a kingdom. Who has the strength? Who has the wealth? Who has the power? We want it to be bigger. We want it to be noticed. We want it to be more impressive. We want it to be able to stand against all other physical kingdoms. Land matters, allegiance matters, policy matters, all of these things as we would build a kingdom. And yet Jesus says, my kingdom isn't like that. You notice Jesus and Pilate as two leaders talking together talk on a whole different level than any of the other conversations that Jesus had. So what world would Jesus' kingdom be from? Another space, another time. It's not about winning with the Romans. And yet most people assume that their Messiah, their new king, would conquer the Romans. Because that's how kingdoms are made. And that's how it's supposed to be. So how would it be defined? If it's not about money and land and power and prestige, then it becomes more about truth and honesty and allegiance to God. 
And how would we define it? Maybe the fact that we fight for the souls of men. That love matters. That spirituality matters. That God is commander and He matters. And what He says matters. And prayer matters. And worship matters. And kindness and how His people behave. There can be truth in Jesus' world. In fact, that's what Jesus claims. I am that truth. And I am the way. And I am the life. And for everyone who would follow Jesus, they're able to find this new kind of kingdom from a different world. And so it's not up to his disciples to be able to fight. I mean, they try that. They only got two swords. One of them is used to cut off a slave of a high priest's ear and it doesn't work and it's not very effective and Jesus is saying that's not what my kingdom is anyway don't you understand and of course they don't Jesus says again from the passage for this purpose I came that I might be king and it's a purpose that came from long ago it's a purpose that was started in the very beginning and it's not Something that was thought up later. It's a purpose to be able to bring grace and love to the world. And we don't fight to get our place in the world. We find God's purpose and we join in with God's purpose. Well, there's several parables Jesus told about the kingdom. In fact, that's his favorite topic. That was what his sermons were all about, is let me tell you about the kingdom. The kingdom's coming soon. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. And all of these things we see as, as Jesus is trying to explain. Let me just share a couple with you today. In Matthew 13 and verse 44, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. And then in joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Okay, so he's found the treasure. Well, that's why we go anywhere, isn't it? We're able to look and see what we like about anything that we would want to purchase, anything we would want to buy. And so he finds this property, and sure enough, there's oil on it, or there's gold on it, or there's, as you might think, a treasure box Always made in a certain way with a certain kind of clasp and certain inlaid things because that looks like a treasure box, doesn't it? I'm sure it had to look like a treasure box if you find a treasure box. So he found a treasure, hides it. Nobody else had seen it. Is he being dishonest? Well, I think dishonesty would be just, I'll steal it. I'll just take the treasure. But he's not going to do that. That's not what he wants to do. I don't want to steal the treasure. I want to own the treasure. And so he goes and he buys the field. Does he pay the treasure price for the field? Eh, I don't know. That gets into all kinds of things. He doesn't give us what the price was. We just know he's honest, honest enough to say, I will buy the field from you. And so he honestly buys the field with the treasure in it, and now the treasure belongs to him. But it also costs everything that he has, every single cent that he owns, every single cent that he can raise. He's had to sell everything. He's had to do everything he possibly can because it is expensive to buy this field with the treasure in it. And now he owns both the field and the treasure. All right. That doesn't mean go out in fields and look for treasure. It means realize the treasure is the kingdom of God. And then how would you own it? How would you get it? What would you do to keep it? And those are the things we find a little bit more difficult. So let me just ask you about your house. The house that you purchase or buy or would like to buy well the house doesn't do anything it just sits there right I mean it's nice to go in especially if it's air-conditioned so you're able to go in and you're able to be inside which is a good thing right now and you decorate it just the way you want it and you paint it all the colors that you want and you put whatever you want on the floor and you put furniture in it that you want and it's just perfect for you 
It doesn't look like the person next door. It doesn't look like the person down the street or anybody else in here because it's yours. And you put in it exactly what you want it to look like because it's yours. You decorate it. You will sleep there tonight. Does that give you some comfort that you know where you're going to be sleeping tonight? Not that you're out somewhere looking for a place to sleep when it's 150 outside. It kind of gives us some comfort. It's hard if you don't have a house. And eventually it becomes to be a place where you belong. A place where you like. It feels like home. Well, what does that mean? It, mean I've, it means I've lived here long enough where it feels like I belong here. It's the place where I should be. It's the, it's the place that I wanted to be because it looks like me and everything around it. And it's where I fit. It's where I belong. And well, how much do you have to pay for that feeling of home? Well, it usually takes 30 years and a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And we're willing to pay for that feeling of home. Because that's what we're building after all. Is a place called home. And we have memories about that place. And a lot of life has happened in that place. And we've had kids in that place. And we've seen grandkids in that place. There are a lot of hidden opportunities in Christ. And the kingdom can be a place called home. And I don't know quite how to describe it other than that. It's not something you can put your fingers on, but it can feel like home. Like you fit there, like you belong there, like you belong with God there, because God is the one who's been there for you through all of these times. Maybe that fits. One of the other parables is about a pearl. Verse 45, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. And so he finds a pearl. Okay. He's a pearl merchant. That's what he does. And so he's found the best pearl. It's one that is beautiful, it's one that is perfect, it's one that looks exactly like it's supposed to look, fills almost the whole oyster. Uh, it is a pearl of great price. It is one that is better, more expensive, more pearly. Yeah, I don't know what pearls are than anything else. And so it is the absolute best pearl you're ever going to have. He has found something worth having, worth owning, because you can look at that one and say, wow, you've got that, you own that, that's amazing. But everybody's got a pearl. Yeah, but they don't have a pearl like this pearl. This pearl is the biggest, best pearl in the world. And once again, he sells everything that he has for it to be his for it to belong to him. Because it was worth all of that, all of the rest of the stuff that he had that was, you know, not very pearly. But now he's got the very best pearl. And it's so valuable. And it's that kind of value that we look for. It's that kind of value we want to invest in. It's what carries through the most important. And I think there's two things that Jesus describes as you look at his teaching about kingdom that are maybe the most important and would be of great value as we look at this kingdom. It's a difficult concept to explain and a difficult one to grasp. And one of those, as he talked about in the beginning, is this purpose and blessing that comes from God. We see God like God really is. We see where God made it all good. And we see all of the goodness of God. And we can see that goodness when we look at creation. And we can look at people around us. And we can look at the beauty of what God made. And oddly enough, God made it all free. 
for His people. All of creation is that way. And we have an inheritance. We have a home with God, a place where we're able to go and be with Him. When we have a God who cares and a God who loves us, and we're able to see that within His purpose of sending Jesus to this earth. And so we're able to see this blessing and purpose of God as we look at all the different things that God does with us. In First Timothy or Second Timothy, excuse me, uh, chapter one and verse nine, it says, "Who saved us and He called us with His holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace." which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Well, Paul has been talking about his suffering and about the reason that he's been suffering and the reason why he does all of this work anyway. And then he comes to explain to Timothy this passage. He saved us. He called us with a holy calling. He has made us our best that we're ever able to be. And it's because of God's purpose and God's grace that Paul would go through all the things that he went through in the first place because he sees those things as most important. He sees those are what God's able to do. He sees God's purpose in all of those things. And he sees that that's what God is doing with him. And it's one of those things that's amazing. I saw this. Grace means all your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. It's what God planned all along. It's what God does in the way he created and what he intended to be done with us and for us and to us. It's following God's plan for us and it makes us have purpose because it was made for us. And he did it by sending Jesus and it was planned before there was anything else, before anything else even existed, even before time existed, so that Jesus might abolish death and bring life and immortality through the gospel. What an incredible thing it is when we look at God's purpose, and so we see what that does for us, and we see how that does with us, and we see what, that's one of the main things that we can look at in life and say, that's a different kingdom. When we look at God's purpose, it's not about everybody claiming and stacking up all of the different possessions that they have. It's more about what's underneath. It's more about the blessing and about the grace of God. The second thing besides the blessing and grace of God is the bond with people. And I think that's another thing we see all the way through as we look at kingdom parables, as we look at the teaching of Jesus, is all of the things that are about this bond that we have with other people. Romans chapter 12 is one of those passages that kind of may help us a little bit in exploring what this is. There are so many passages that talk about one another and about what was done and about how we share and about how we care about each other. As Paul writes in Romans, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so Paul writes to the Romans about what they have together. And about some of the blessings just of being part of each other. We are one body in Christ. That's who we are. Because we have this oneness in this whole body of Christ that binds us all together by his blood. And he's brought us all to be uh, together in this. That that's who we are. That we have this one body as, as he describes it here. It's 
again, one of those pictures. How do you describe a kingdom? Well, it kind of looks like you do. A uh, lot of different parts that all do different things, but somehow it works. Somehow you're able to walk and talk and able to relate to other people and able to do other things. And so he says, don't think about yourself as most important because that's not how a body works where it, each part thinks it's the best part. But just realize that we all have a part. And God blesses everyone with a measure of faith. And God's given us different places in this body. But we are one body in Christ. And then he goes on to say, and God has gifted people with different gifts. Well, that's an amazing thing. That God not only makes us part of this by the blood of Jesus and allows us then to have this this body together in Christ, that we are one, that we are built together, that it's part of who we are. But then he blesses us with gifts. And what kind of gifts would he give us? Man, that'd be great. Be like Christmas, right? We're excited. What's he going to give me? He's going to give you something for somebody else. Oh, He's not going to give me something for me? Not at all. He's going to give you something for somebody else so that you can do something for somebody else. Isn't that great? It is amazing. Because what better thing can you get than something that you could give for somebody else? And so he mentions prophecy and service and teaching and building up and giving and leading But all of those that he gives are not because you will be the greatest servant. It's not like the disciples as they argued about, well, I'm a greater servant than you are, and I'm much more humble. Somewhere you lose that argument along the way, don't you? But he talks about teaching for other people, about service for other people, about exhortation or building up for building up other people, about giving For the good of others. You're not giving so that you can get. Or maybe that's the way you do it. I give to myself. No, that's not giving. That's called keeping. And so giving is when you're going to pass it on to somebody else. For the good of others. Leading in what God wants. And taking other people somewhere where God wants them to be. And we see the early church was so strong in all of this because they did all of these things together. And when you think about it, it's amazing to go back and look at those times where all of those people came together and had crucified Jesus, but they're all together and they realized the repentance that was needed on Pentecost. And there's over 3,000 of them that say, yeah, it's my fault, I did it. And they repent of their sins and they're baptized into Christ. And then they want to continue as this one body together. And so what do they do? Well, they meet together and they eat together in different people's houses. They meet together in Solomon's portico. It'll hold a ton of people. And so they've got all of these things going. They pray. The apostles then become arrested. Well, that's pretty concerning, but that just means they join together and they pray, and they have these daily teachings, and it's from house to house, and then when they're finally released from prison, it's such an amazing, huge thing, because God has just affirmed them and said, I know you're going to be arrested, I know it's going to be difficult, but don't ever doubt for a minute that I am not there with you in this, and they can feel that they're part of something bigger. They can feel that they're part of a kingdom. And it's one of those amazing times that you're able to see. Have you ever been on a campaign, gone to El Salvador maybe, gone on a mission trip, even just sent kids to camp? Why do we send them to camp? Well, because doing something away from your normal activity creates bonds. And we want them to be able to bond together. Besides that, we get a week off. And so we want them to go to camp for their good. And it does something for them. And when you've been involved in doing things, it makes you stronger and closer to each other. The people that are involved in the VBS last year, 
you realize you're part of something bigger. The people who teach our Bible classes, they realize they're part of making the new church. Right now, we should be doing teacher bags. We just don't know what it's going to look like. It's something we've done a lot, but we don't know whether teachers are going back, if they're going to be online, exactly what would they need. And so that may be a little bit delayed this year. We'll, we'll still try and do something, but you, we don't even know how to tell you what to bring. And most of that's out anyway. The more involved we are, the more we invest the more we become one body in Christ. And that seems to be very hard to do right now. Because even when we can to get together, we have to wear masks so you can't tell what they're saying or doing or anything, and it becomes more difficult. It's a much harder time working together. You see, the early church was involved with each other and in working and doing those things. And it's been my experience over the past few years, that's, that's a lot of few, that any time activities stop and the church quits going and quits reaching out, then they start turning and looking in. And we get very critical of each other. And we start at nitpicking at all the little things. You see, as long as you're going and doing something, you don't have time for all of that. But when it's just you and somebody else standing in a room and there's nothing else to do, you start going, well, those colors don't match. Their socks don't even match. Why would they wear those shoes? Those shoes are not even practical. We don't even like those shoes. Don't they know their mask should match their outfit? I mean, after all, shouldn't we have a little bit of time to be able to make things work? And we start being critical of everything. And that's not the body of Christ. We do much better when we stay on mission and we stay on point. So let me encourage you to be the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, by still learning to pray and still reaching out and still thinking about other people as they struggle. One example of a kingdom that maybe we'll relate to is a magic kingdom. You may have been there. You may have seen this. This is a kingdom built by men. If you try and get a ticket to go in right now, I think it's around $150 because it's really hard, and that's just for one day for one park, not meaning you can jump to other parks. But When you try and get a ticket, you realize there are six tiers of, I guess, pricing to go in to this kingdom built by man. So it may go up from there a lot. And then when you purchase your ticket, you're not purchasing the ticket based on the price of the day you purchased it. You're purchasing your ticket based on the price of the day you go. And so the actual day in which you go, they may just charge you more. And so they will also allow you to come in to see their beautiful kingdom, to go in and charge you three or four times as much as what you would ever pay for a bottle of water, for a hamburger, for a snack, for any kind of thing you want to eat. And then there are shows, and you can go in and watch the shows, but they've got the souvenir shop if you want to buy some of the souvenirs. And you would certainly want to remember your trip that you were going on to this magic kingdom. And they build a fence around it, and they charge admission for it, and we find it's that way with every single thing that's beautiful in the world. That's the kingdom of man. Because it's all about profit. When you start seeing it being all about profit and all about us and all about being as big as we can be, you buy the ride, you buy what you can see, you buy it by the hour. Well, actually, they'll tell you it's for all day, but they're closing at 11. So, I mean, really, it's by the hour. When we go to Washington to see our kids... One of the favorite things that happens there 
because we always pick the right time to go, is blackberries. And their backyard, and it doesn't matter where they live, I've learned, always has blackberries. And they are the biggest, sweetest blackberries you have ever seen anywhere. And they grow in every ditch. They grow in every alley. They grow wild by the side of the road. They grow along every lane. They grow everywhere that people haven't been able to get rid of them. And they are so good and they are so sweet. And they are absolutely free. Because that's how God would do it. That's how God would give. And he just makes them available. Here they are. You can get them. Well, if you don't want to get stuck by the thorns, yes, you can buy them in the little plastic package in the store. And maybe it's worth that not to get stuck by the thorns because there are lots of thorns. But I want you to know that they're everywhere. Maybe today in Florida or in Arizona, or not today, but when you get to the right season of the year, there's oranges. Oranges are a little bit different because usually they're in people's yards and they just don't grow everywhere along the side of the road. But don't worry, soon there will be people putting boxes of oranges along the side of the road. Please take my oranges. I've got to get rid of these oranges because we've just got too many. And that's what the blessing of God is like. And so I want you to remember the blessings and the promises of God. And that that's what those are like. And to remember why we're together is because of Jesus Christ. Because he puts us together. And because being in the purpose of God and being what God is intending for us to do is, is just so natural and so wonderful. And his grace that he gives to us is like blackberries. And the redemption that we see through Jesus Christ as we accept him the same way they did at the beginning. Our repentance, our baptism into Christ, and then our coming together to meet. And our coming together to be part of this body of Christ. And if you just stopped with the baptism, you're going to miss the blackberries. You're going to miss the best part of it where all of us are joined together. And the teaching and exhorting and encouraging all comes in to fill us. And we're able to be part of the kingdom of God. And it really is a kingdom from another world. Because it's like nothing else that you will see anywhere. In the way it operates, in the people who are in it, and in what you get out of it. I truly pray today that you are part of that kingdom. Thank you for watching our video. We have a lot more content here on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get the latest notifications when we have new material come out, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.